So yesterday we we're talking about what I feel is happening right in front of us, which is the death of feminist culture, the fact that, that, that feminism has now devolved into absolute nonsense. I mean, it, they, we see that feminism has led all these women into the workplace who are getting treated like pieces of meat. Uh, we see feminism is turned into this thing where men get to pretend to be women and then participate in female sports and win everything. I mean, it's just been a de degradation of women. I think it is falling apart in front of our eyes. And I think the attack on femininity and masculinity is also starting to backfire. In fact, I have a Prager, my PragerU feminism video is coming out on Monday. We'll play it uh, here. But I think that, you know, you ha we have to talk about the fact that the tension between manhood and Christian culture is built into our culture. You know, in the old days before Christianity, manhood was pretty simple. You went uh, after the other guy, you took his stuff, you took his women, and you left town. You know, you, you conquered his land, you, you raped the women. That was manhood. And, you know, in, if you look at, like, Homer, the warriors, the men, the admirable heroes, are, they're just big athletes. That's what they are. I mean, Achilles is kind of a, a, a crank, but he is a great warrior and a great uh, killer. And so that's what a man was. And even though, yes, there were all kinds of varieties of uh, men in the classical world, just that, like there are all kinds of varieties of men today, I'm talking about an image that's in people's minds. And when you had Christianity, which touted sacrifice, which touted martyrdom, which touted uh, humility and uh, being a humble person, that's not really what men are about. You know, <laughs> men are not about like, oh, yes, you know, peel my skin off and I'll go to heaven. That's great. You know, that's not where men want to be. And that was why the church invented chivalry. Chivalry was basically an invention of the Catholic Church to tame the louts who were knights. The real knights were just louts. They would just go around. They would do the men thing. They would go around raping and pillaging and killing, fighting each other over like 15 feet of ground. And the church said, here's a new version of manhood as a, man, a version of service, a version of standing up for the little guy, a version of, uh, of sacrifice and uh, chastity. That, that, and that's where all the knighthood tales came about. Modernity is basically invented when Shakespeare and Cervantes start to put real people into the chivalric model and show how that leads to tragedy and comedy, right? Don Quixote is ridiculous because he believes in all the noble ideas of chivalry. That's what makes him ridiculous. That's what makes it a comic novel. That's where all the kind of, you know, uh, vitality of that novel comes from. Shakespeare does the same thing. You know, Hamlet was a play before Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Hamlet was a play where a ghost of a dead father comes to Hamlet and says, I was murdered, avenge my death. And Hamlet says, okay, and he does. But Shakespeare puts a real person in there, a modern person, and the ghost says, avenge my death. And Hamlet says, uh, you know, is a ghost real? Do I know the guy's a murderer? Can I kill him when he's praying? You know, he starts to have doubts because he doesn't fit in, because human beings don't fit into the ideal chivalric model. Macbeth is, an, is another example of a tragedy based on that kind of disjunction where Lady Macbeth keeps saying to him, be a man and commit murder. Be a, a man and do the thing that men do, which is kill your way to the top. And Macbeth is tortured and they, they live in this Christian world, so their consciences tear them to shreds uh, because that, that view of manhood is no longer operational in the Christian world. And today, like the chivalric code has uh, collapsed, and we, that's what I was talking about yesterday. With it, the only where, place on in TV that you see manhood is in shows like The Sopranos and Breaking Bad, where it's an outlaw thing to be. To be a man is to be an outlaw because the Christian world no longer has a model for manhood, and that's why I pick on superhero movies because they show a model for manhood that is simply detached from the realities of life. It is detached from death. It's detached from sex, and the, the Marvel tries to make up for that by having them be snarky, but there's no real tragedy in their manhood, which is what part of, part of what uh, Shakespeare and Cervantes were talking about when they invented modernity by, by putting real people into the chivalric code, okay? So our job now, I feel, as the, as the feminist model falls apart, the feminist attack on masculinity and femininity falls apart is we, as conservatives, have to start to build a new culture of masculinity and femininity. It has to be a modern culture. It has to be based, it's gonna to have to be based on Christianity as we understand it in the modern world. It's not gonna be medieval Christianity. It's not gonna be medieval manhood. It's not gonna be superhero manhood either because none of us is really superheroes. We have to invent this new idea. And
The other thing about this is we have also, if we are going to restore the idea of what men and women are, what they really are, not going back into the past, not saying, oh, women have to you know, do this, this, and this, and can't leave the home and can't vote, although that's not such a bad idea. No, I'm joking. But, but you know, not restricting people, but just getting, uh, recreating the ideas on which our ideas of ourselves are founded, recreating the culture in, on, in which our ideas make sense, if we are going to do that, Christianity also has to be held to account. It also has to be held to account for the ways in which barnacles have accrued on it over the years that we don't need, that are not part of the kingdom of Christ, that are not the things that Jesus was talking about. And that's why I've been hammering the Catholic Church. There was a moment on, because, you know, there's so many people in the, in the Catholic Church who are saying, well, it's in the past. These people raped children in the past. It's all over. It was just, you know, there are no more uh, molesters in the Catholic Church than anywhere else which, if you're the body of Christ, is not a good excuse. I'm sorry. There was a moment on Special Report last night that was so powerful and really summed it all up because uh, Brett Baer, who is himself a Catholic, had the uh, Bishop of Pittsburgh, which is where a lot of these, this latest scandal come up, uh, David Zubik, and Bear asks him about this scan- the, the effect the scandal is having on people who don't are not going to church because they feel so betrayed. And you can sit there and say, you know, like, oh well, they're taking it out on God. Oh well, they're making the mistake. They didn't rape the kids. They didn't cover it up. Even more importantly, because I know the rapes are horrendous and hideous, and these people should be in prison. And the fact that their uh, the time has run out when they can be prosecuted is a crying shame. But the people who covered it up, including the man who's going to answer Brett Baer's question, who's one of the people who covered it up, they're still in place. Not one, not one has been fired. I mean, this is the thing. So, so what they're talking about when they say, oh, it's in the past, it's not in the past as long as they're still standing there. The cardinal, the, the guy who was uh, at the center of this invest- investigation, uh, Cardinal Wirrell, is now the, the cardinal in Washington, D.C. So here is Brett Baer asking this heartfelt question. This is two videos. The first one is, is Baer asking this question of Bishop David Zubik and listen to his response. What do you say to the Catholics who didn't go to church this Sunday because they were so hurt? You know, the Washington Post says clergy's abuse scandals prompt crisis of faith, crisis of confidence. Um, there's hurt. I talk to him. I mean, I come to you as a newsman, but I'm also a practicing Catholic. Um, and I talked to a lot of people this weekend. And Brett, how about rage? Because I'm feeling it too. I was ordained a priest 43 years ago, and the collar that I wear is a source of pride for me. And the fact that I know that some of the people who served it with this collar abuse people makes me enraged. What I have to say is we need to be able to come closer to God to first of all, to look at the cross, and that's why I wear this cross on my lapel. First of all, the cross is a sign of why did Jesus get there? It was because of our sins. And looking at the cross, we have to be able to see our own sins in it. But the second thing is the cross is also a sign of where we need to go from here. And I think that for anybody who chose not to come to church this weekend, who somehow is taking this out on God, it's precisely the opposite that we all need. You know, I've prayed more over the course of these last these last days, and I would encourage other people to do the same. So this is what he's saying, and the Pope has put out a letter saying, even though it can be said that most of these cases belong to the past, nonetheless, as time goes on, we have come to know the pain of many of the victims. We have realized that these wounds never disappear and that they require us forcefully to condemn these atrocities and join forces in uprooting this culture of death. These wounds never go away. The heart-wrenching pain of these victims, which cries out to heaven, was long ignored, kept quiet, or silenced. But their outcry was more powerful than all the measures meant to silence it or sought even to resolve it by decisions that increased its gravity by falling into complicity. The Lord heard that cry and once again showed us on which side he stands. Now, all right, that's the church speaking. That's the Pope and this bishop. Now listen to Mark Thiessen, who's a good guy and a former uh, speechwriter for George W. Bush. Listen to his reaction as a Catholic. 
So I'm glad the Pope wrote a letter, but the one word that was missing in that letter was accountability. Uh, he, he, we don't need words, we need actions right now uh, in the Catholic Church. He said that, uh, the, he quoted Pope Benedict saying how much filth there is in the Church and talked about those who kept quiet or silenced the victims. One of those people who, who silenced the victims was your guest, Bishop Zubik. He was, from 1987 to 91, the personal secretary to Bishop, to Bishop Bellavacqua. He was then the director of clergy personnel from 91 to 96 for Archbishop Worrell when he was the Bishop of Pittsburgh when all these confidentiality agreements were being signed, when all these predator priests were being moved around. This, he was at the epicenter of this crisis. He pointed that cross on his, on, on his lapel. You know what Christ did on that cross? He sacrificed himself. I'd like to see one of the hundred bishops in this country sacrifice themselves, saying, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, and I say to my other fellow bishops, step down and let new leaders take over. Uh, good for you, Mark, because that's the voice. That's the voice of the God who hears those cries and not, you know, these guys, they don't want to give up their houses. They don't want to give up their titles. They don't want to give up the wealth. They're princes of the church and they don't want to give up their prince, their princehood. But the thing is, if we are, go you know, this culture is, this is a moment of opportunity. It is a moment of opportunity when one way passes and a new way comes. I know it looks like a moment of crisis, but the crisis is all an opportunity. Every one of us, every one of us has a piece of the culture in his hand. Every one of us has a chance to act like a man, to reinvent what a man is, to act like a woman, to reinvent what a woman is. Every one of us has, has that possibility. And when these large structures let us down, as the Catholic Church has, and as some of these co huge social media corporations are trying to, it is up to each one of us to start to reinvent the world. Each one of us is given a soul of his own to reinvent the world with, and we have to start to do it. It really is, it, it's a big deal, even though each one of us is a small thing, each one of us doing it is a, an enormous deal.